Welcome to Slow and Steady, the podcast where you get to follow along as we figure out how to build and run a SaaS. Each week, we'll give you an honest peek into our lives as we work on our products and keep the lights on by doing whatever necessary. Today is July 7th, and this is episode number 48. Brian is away camping again, so I am joined by Arvid Karl today. Arvid is one of the co-founders of Feedback Panda, which he founded with his partner, Danielle Simpson. Eventually, they sold the company um, after growing it to 55k MRR, which is quite impressive. After leaving their business, Arvid started working on a book called Zero to Sold, which he published last week. And I figured it would be interesting to have him on as a guest to talk about the book and its origins. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's quite the pleasure. I'm a lo long time listener. I'm happy to be here today. Finally, that's, that's always been one of the things I wanted to do. So thank you very much for the, for the opportunity. You're very welcome. You're a podcast host yourself, right? Uh, you're hosting mm. the, the Bootstrap the Founder podcast? Yeah, but I mean, hosting, right? I'm, I'm just doing it. I don't have guests oh, on yeah. that show. I, <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I, I try. It's, it's one of those things that I built um, as some sort of accountability system to myself. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I started writing for the blog that I've launched in November 2019, which is now, I think, eight months ago, um, I really needed some way to make sure that I actually reliably write something every single week. So first I started a newsletter. So I have to have a some sort of article to actually write, mm -hmm. to put in the newsletter to send to people. And then I found that was not enough. So I added a podcast that I would have to actually <laughs> think through the article more and think about other things that I can associate with it, that I can tell people. So all of the things I've been doing are kind of a result of me being extremely lazy and trying to mm -hmm. develop through a system some sort of discipline to actually keep it going. And that has been quite successful to this point. You should definitely get a co-host on the on the podcast if that's the core reason for the for doing it because that adds another level of accountability. <laughs> oh, I, I bet you you have a lot of fun on this podcast uh, <laughs> trying to schedule stuff uh, stuff and just show up, right? And have something to talk about every single week. Yeah, I, I bet that's that's a lot of work. Uh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm happy that, that okay. today I can be your replacement, Brian. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as I said in the intro, Brian is on uh, on a vacation doing some camping. Um, he recently mentioned that like now that that campgrounds are opening up again, he basically jumps on every single opportunity there is, just like use it while, while they can. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what oh, yeah. they're doing today. Well, yeah, I, I wish I, I could do that here in Berlin, but uh, I think surrounding the city there may, might be a few places that are not completely full just yet but looking at the people and <laughs> how they respond to sunlight and how, how the barbecues come come out immediately if there's a ray of sunshine yeah um yeah. i i wouldn't i wouldn't expect there to be um the, any campgrounds that are not completely full at this point even with the restric <laughs> yeah. restrictions yeah. in the country like, i i bet people are just hanging out there all the time so sure i try not to as well yeah mm -hmm. Well, the main reason why I brought you on uh, as a guest today is uh, you launched a book last week. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That that has been... Like, launching Zero to Sold has been one of the weirdest, most enjoyable, and humble and, and grateful experiences of my life so far. Really, it has been... I, I had zero expectations when I went into that. I mean, I've been, like I said, been writing for eight months at this point. I pretty much started writing the moment I sold my prior business because I needed something to do. And I think we can mm -hmm. talk about that kind of stuff at a later point during the episode. But I just wrote articles, little blog posts here and there about everything that I wanted to talk about. And then it kind of turned into, a, I would say, a compendium, a, a guide, a collection of things. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, well, I, I would like to have this as a PDF. And I would also pay you for that. Can we do this? Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, that that was at, at that point that the compendium itself was like twenty five thousand words because I had already written. When was it? Maybe in January this year. So it must have been three months, four weeks, twelve, fifteen something articles. And I had added um, little 
paragraphs for all the things that I hadn't yet written an article about, but always wanted to to write something about. And there was this gigantic list of blog post titles for things I had yet to write. So it was maybe like yeah. 60, 70 articles that I wanted to write and 15 that I already had written at that point. So I just really quickly in a, in a couple of days went through every single title and just wrote a paragraph of what I, the, the best thing I knew about it. And that was the compendium. I released that in mm -hmm. must have been January or, or February this this uh, in 2020 before the world ended, and, <laughs> and then um, people really liked it because it was going from just having an in inkling of an idea, just like a potential of a business, to actually selling it. All the steps in between. That was what I was thinking about and was writing about, and then people just really told me, "Yeah, this should really be a book." I, and it wasn't even my idea. It was just people reading it, telling me, yeah, you should turn this mm -hmm. into a book. And when people on Twitter and people in the in the hacker sphere tell you that they would really like something, that's a pretty good sign of validation. And when they would even, like, they could print this as a PDF from the website because it was, a, it still is a one-page HTML document that you could just print out yeah. into a, like an ebook or whatever if you wanted to. But people w were already suggesting that they would pay me money for it, um, which is... A, pretty clear sign that there's something in there and it, it's not that i really am like hunting after money here it's just that there's an opportunity for me to make this into something even better even bigger that helps people more efficiently right yeah. focus just yeah. something else than a, a guide on the web so yes that happened so i wrote the book wrote the rest of the articles um then i i figured out how to publish because nobody tells you how to do that self-publishing and all these things um Took me took me quite a while. Talked a lot to other founders and I, I guess successful authors in the space who had self published, um, and had essentially asked them how to do it, and they helped me with that, which was really cool. And then I published the thing on Monday, the must have been the 29th of June, so that's now uh, eight days ago, the time of recording this. Yeah. And I sent out a tweet with a couple links to the Amazon page and the Gumroad page and all these things and explaining what I did and how I did it, I expected maybe, hopefully, 20, maybe 30, maybe 50 people buying it on the first day because I, I had no idea. I had never written a book before, never launched a book before, never considered myself an author. I, I mean, up until I sold the business, I hadn't even considered myself an entrepreneur, to be honest. I was just always a software engineer. And mm -hmm. like the, uh, mostly mediocre one, right? It was not a 10x, it may, may have been a 0.8x or something, you know, like just <laughs> building stuff because I like it, but not like the gurus in the field that have these courses and that have these gigantic followings was never mine. But um, yeah, it turned out that people really enjoyed what I was doing and had been following me for the reason to support me once I actually put it out somewhere. So yeah. Within hours, I had hundreds of orders. I think the the end of the day must have been five hundred something people buying the book, or was it like three hundred fifty? It was seven times my expectations. It was pr probably three fifty, which was crazy to me. Like three hundred fifty people had ordered my book at that point, mm -hmm. it was a digital copy, because Amazon for some reason doesn't show you the paperback orders until they're actually being delivered. So now, mm -hmm. at this point, numbers are actually going up even from the people buying it on the first day. So um, I, I cannot explain to you how I felt because I'm still feeling it. Again, can still not explain it. It's like this <laughs> amount of support and gratitude coming back from a community that I've been sharing stuff with for free, that I've been engaging with, helping with, empowering as much as I could. I, I mean, it's kind of clear that this stuff happens, but I had not expected it. And I, I mm -hmm. still am, am blown away by the reception. Not only have people bought the book, they also actually reach out to me telling me that it's a good book. Like that's the icing on the cake. <laughs> like Because <laughs> not only do they think it's nice, they actually looked at it and still consider it to be useful. Which yeah, is yeah. For, for a person like me who is, I, I, I guess it's clear at this point that I'm also German and uh, English may not be my, my first language. And um, that that is... To, to me feels like quite the accomplishment that I'm starting to be able to celebrate it because yeah, you know, yeah. there's a certain level of humility that we get raised on that you don't talk about your success too much, right? You kind of mm -hmm. keep it in and you suppress the, the overflow of emotions. Well, now I'm just letting it out. I'm super happy.
you know. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good but like it. that all sounds like um, that eight months ago when you started writing, mm -hmm. it was mostly by accident. Is that well, yeah, yeah. That's right. Maybe maybe let me tell you where this all all comes from. I mean, I've been on a, a number of podcasts. Most notably, I think the Indie Hackers podcast. Like Cortland invited me over the moment we sold the business. Um, he reached mm -hmm. out to me and said, well, "Won't you want to come on a podcast and maybe talk about that?" Maybe. Um, oh, of course, yeah. I did. Like everybody in our space loves indie hackers, the, the podcast, the website, the community. But we wouldn't be where we are in terms of the, the sharing of knowledge and contribution of people to other people's projects um, without it, the indie hackers thing that Cortland and, and uh, his brother built. Right? This this is this is a yep. big thing. So I went on that podcast and I explained the whole Feedback Panda story. But let me just give you the, the quick digest here. We um, I've, I've been a software engineer since yeah ninth grade, I guess, uh, or at least that's where I started coding. To, I, I think I started working professionally in software in 2004. I founded a lot of businesses that just imploded and exploded and did all things, all different kinds of mm -hmm. uh, failures that happened along the way. I've, I've worked for we see funded companies. I've worked for traditional German software engineering businesses, which you know exactly how they work, like where a lot of people <laughs> wear a, a lot of like uh, mustache and weird hairdo. And just, yeah, you know, it's like German businesses, the equivalent of what you would expect a German business to be in the IT space. So I've, I've seen it all, I guess. And um, I've been a salaried employee for quite a while, had a couple of like bootstrap businesses that I tried to uh, take off the ground. A couple of them worked and then exploded. A couple of them exploded immediately. And then finally in... Um, 2017, my my life partner Danielle, she started teaching English online, and uh, she worked from home. And this was a job that was kind of necessitated because she had a problem walking. She had like an injury at that point, so she needed to find a job that works from home where she could work and make some money. Also, using her qualifications as a native English speaker, quite useful to teach English online. So she did that. Yeah. Figured out that there were a couple of unsolved problem in her space and co essentially complained to me. And then, um, as an engineer, you hear a complaint about software or something that has to do with the virtual space, and you think of building something to help with that. So we figured out mm -hmm. who's, who's the market here, what's their problem, how can we solve this, and how can we turn this into a product. We did that. And then we built a feedback generation tool for English online teachers because they would need to give students um, or the parents of the kids they taught some sort of text-based feedback every lesson. They were teaching different kids for different parents for different schools, and every parent wanted to know the last hour, what did my kid learn and how can they improve? And this kind of feedback was very templatable. It's, let me just call it that. Like you can yeah. really write it ahead and then just kind of modify it later. And we built a feedback templating tool called Feedback Panda that would integrate with all these online English schools. And we start, started selling it to all these online English teachers who themselves were contracted to these Chinese online English teaching communities. So there's a lot of <laughs> global community in there, but most of our customers are almost exclusively were North American um, teachers, online English teachers, mostly female and mostly working from home. So that was a pretty clear niche, was very obviously everybody having the same kind of problem, needing the same kind of solution, that situation, which in my experience at that point kind of indicated that it would be much more successful than trying to sell to the whole world at the same time because I'd been burned a couple of times before. And yeah. Feedback Panda worked amazingly. The, the company was profitable a couple of weeks into actually releasing the product because we charged from the beginning. We had a 30-day trial, but people actually started paying us before the trial was over. So that was a validation. And then we just kept growing the business. Not necessarily that we even did anything. Word of mouth was just extremely strong in our community. And we facilitated that by being part of the community, by celebrating teachers, by being on, on social media, all these kind of things that you do. If you mm. know how your niche ticks, then you kind of amplify what's happening in there and you benefit from that. And so in the middle of 2019, almost two years after founding the business, we were approached by Shoreswift Capital, a private equity company, um, it was a Canadian American um, or Canadian US American company. And they asked us if we might not be interested in actually selling the business. And then we actually considered it and said, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. And then we sold the business for what I'm allowed to say is a life changing amount of money. And ever since then, 
um, I've been writing. Because when you sell a business like this, that is a business of two people with, at that point, 5,000 customers and a MRR of $55,000 uh, every single month with barely any expenses, there's a lot of pressure. And there's a lot of work to be done if you don't have any employees, which was a mistake. But that's one of the things that I write about in the book. It's like the whole book was an opportunity for me to deal with all my mistakes and to really write what didn't. Mm. Right? That's <laughs> now, Many of the things in the book are a, a result of this or just an explanation of it even. Like here's what I did wrong and here's the, the consequence of it. And there's many of these things. Like engineering our own invoicing system. Well, that was fairly stupid, but I did it anyway. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, ever since then, I've started writing because I really needed something to do. I, I stopped working and it was a 24-7 kind of thing. I was in customer service for technical things the whole time. I, you probably can relate to that. And I, I was just doing feature work, even though I felt like I don't want to work on features right now. You probably can also relate to that, judging from the last episode of this very podcast yeah. that I listened to. <laughs> you know, you are, you are consistently stressed and there's a consistent level of anxiety. And unless you find somebody else to take this work from you, it's super hard to let it go. So you built up this kind of internal momentum, this kind of speed at which you operate at all times. And then if you sell a business and you hand over all your keys to the business to somebody else, you are, it's like this wily e. coyote moment where you run over the cliff and you keep running and you're still going forward and you don't notice that there's no cliff anymore. There's no ground. And you just look mm. down and then you start dropping. And um, it just felt exactly the same way for me. I had so much energy, so much momentum, and I, I had nothing to do with my time because all of a sudden this other engineer was doing the work that I was doing before. All of a sudden we had hired with the, the company that bought us a person that would take over the engineering and another person that would take over the customer service. So all the things yeah. that I was doing all day, poof, were gone and I was mm -hmm. doing nothing. So I opened Notion and I just typed for a couple hours the, the, the titles of the blog posts that I always wanted to write and um, that was a couple dozen. I, I, I think at this moment it might be 150 because I've st still been adding in, in the past. And then I started really just writing the outlines for a couple of them, writing a couple paragraphs here and there, actually writing a blog post, a uh, number of blog posts. I think I had reached 10. And then I started my blog, thebootstrapfounder.com for everybody who wants to type this extremely long name um, and, and released 10 of those blog posts at the same time and then continuously added one every single week. And I have done so, yeah, since November last year, um, which has been quite useful because I'm, I'm going to come to a finish, I promise. Um, all of the, these blog posts kind of led me to understand that there was a narrative going through them. Because of, of obviously building a business is, in retrospect, some sort of narrative, right? You start somewhere, you do take a couple steps here, may not work out, take a step back, go somewhere else, and you just... You find your own way, but it is a way. In retrospect, you will see that there's like a, a thread connecting all these individual steps. And it was the same in my writing. I noticed that all my blog posts that I had written, and these were random. I think the first one was on how to do customer service at scale. The next one was on how to find a problem. And then how to, I don't know, how to build, uh, how to not build an invoicing system from scratch. You know, these kind of <laughs> things, all, some are technical, some were like, um, per, per, like, uh, HR related, others were just structural, strategic, like all different kinds. And then I saw the connection and I turned them into the compendium. And from there, the book took shape. So I wrote a book without knowing that I was writing a book, but just really writing everything I knew, which turns out is a book. <laughs> Pretty. <much. laughs> so that's, that's why I'm at right now. Um, having had all these little points from different stages of running a business connected into one big narrative, which is Zero to Sold, the book that I launched eight days ago. That's an, that's an awesome ride. Like, uh, yeah. just like having, having too much momentum and then suddenly the momentum turns into a book. I was, I was planning to ask this question later on, but, um, it kind of fits in here right now. Like given like for the last eight months, you have been using the momentum to write um, and now you launched a book. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I guess there's still some momentum in you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, 
the, the thing is that in in our space once you are once you produce content somewhere and and people really like what you're saying there's so many opportunities right it, it, it was probably 10 minutes after i released the the twitter thread announcing that my book was out that somebody asked if there's going to be an ebook of uh, not not an ebook but an audiobook of this right it didn't mm-hmm. take people 10 minutes to say this is not enough i want more i want something <laughs> different so um that is happening i guess but don't really have a choice i guess because everybody expects here's the thing it's it's a print book okay it has to be an audiobook it has to be an ebook and then probably an mp3 cd because there's probably three people on earth <laughs> who still listen to this kind of stuff um no judgment it's perfectly fine but you know like there's there's all these expectations that come with spreading some sort of message or some sort of knowledge that to make it more accessible so that's going to happen. And then people have started asking if I'm going to like do some sort of course where they can have a more um, like audio visual approach to ma- maybe the whole journey, maybe a specific part of it. So that also feels like an interesting thing. I'm kind of deliberating right now what part of this very, I wouldn't say general, but very the whole journey, uh, all encompassing kind of book, I would like to be more specific on. So I'm still looking for input on that, to be honest, because there's so much going on. I can barely have time to think clearly about what's going to happen next week, let alone, you know, a couple months from now. But there's still so much to do and so much topics that come up every single day that are important for bootstrappers, important for founders. I mean, look at the whole debate around Hey.com and uh, the the walled garden of the the Apple at the app store and how to mm. make sure to diversify your platforms. I talked about this on my podcast a couple of weeks ago because I just feel this is so important that like you build an app. It's great. But if, if Apple says no, then all your revenue is gone forever and you have no way of fighting it. Right. This is a problem. And that's something yeah, that yeah. from an, I guess like a more exposed position, I see more people having this problem. I get in touch with people who have this problem and I can kind of uh, channel this into some sort of, wouldn't call it advice, but just information, what's happening and how how can you try to not have to deal with this exclusively and find other ways. And then, yeah, and then and the other thing, Hey.com is a source of great inspiration, the whole privacy thing, the tracker, like the tracking pixel situation. How can you deal with building a business that is supportive of other SaaS businesses in a time where privacy is such a big issue, where you want to build Let's call let's call it like a software that helps people with uh, marketing attribution. But now you have to think about well, am I even allowed to track people coming mm-hmm. from this website going into this service, or do they have to agree to that? And how can I make this happen? Is this something that is can my business even happen in this field? Right. So um, there's a lot of these questions, and they just come up every single day. And I feel there's so much to think about and write about. I have material for years. So the momentum won't go, <laughs> well, it won't run dry, that's for sure. But I honestly, I don't have a clear vision of where I'm going. And I never really had. Like the whole book came to came to be because somebody told me, yeah, I would actually pay $10 for a PDF of this. So I thought, well, yeah. then I'm going to make a PDF and sell it to you for $10. <laughs> Turns out that worked really well. I think on Gumroad, yeah. where I sell, yeah. sell exactly this, I have 380 something book sales in the first week that people who actually wanted that. Right. And um, I was just uh, listening to a, a Blink on, on Blinkist, an app that I really like for quickly reading books. Like they have this n- neat little 15 minute summary of books of a, of a book um, that also mentioned this whole pickaxe and, and shovel kind of situation. Right. If you want to build a business or if you want to make anything meaningful, go into a market that is already existing, help the people in that market be more successful. And I think I realized this this morning. And I, again, sometimes I feel quite stupid when it comes to this because I should have realized this earlier. But Zero to Salt is that. It is a map of the territory. It's kind of helping people to understand which pickaxe they need to mm-hmm. go to gold rush kind of situation, right? To go to the, the vein of gold or like fish it out of the river or whatever, whatever people do to get gold nowadays. But it's a kind of, you want to help people help themselves. And I, I talk about this a lot when it comes to customer service, but this info product, the book, is the exact same thing. 
I want to give people yeah. a meaningful way of figuring out what problems may lay may may, may lay a, a, along the way may, may lie that's the word um, and how to potentially address them. Not everything is immediately solved, and I that's the thing about books like this. Advice is easily given, and it often doesn't apply perfectly to anyone's um, real unique business situation and. I mean, I'm a I'm a person. This has been my first real successful business, but I've been in many semi-successful and in a lot of unsuccessful businesses before. So the advice doesn't come from me building a business in two years. That is a big part of some of the things, but most of the mm -hmm. advice actually comes from me failing throughout the last ten years in many many different ways. So, and I say this many times in the book: don't follow advice blindly. Not mine. Not anyone else's. And I, I think Rob Walling has been saying this very succinctly a couple weeks ago on episode, what was it, 499.5, I think, or 499 of Startups for the Rest of Us, because it was just the one leading up to the big, big uh, 500, which is amazing, if you ask me, to have a podcast with so many episodes. And he was saying, it's it's easy to give advice, and many people have to replicate um, what they're doing before um, people take them seriously. But I think I've been there, and funny enough, the book itself is just like another startup. I have the feeling that this whole process yeah. of building this Twitter audience community around me, engaging with people, making sure their problems are heard and solved through the book is exactly the same as building a SaaS and talking to customers, validating and iterating on features, like writing a first draft and releasing version 1.0. There's literally no difference if you look at it from this kind of bird's eye perspective. So... It's it's funny that the book itself helped being sold by having a lot of the the kind of thoughts and patterns and strategies and tactics that are in the book being used to sell it, if, if you think about that. Might be a bit meta mm. at this point, but the whole point is the info product and a SaaS business and an e-commerce business and the marketplace, they all kind of follow the same pattern. You have an audience that you should validate exists in the real world. They have a problem which you should validate to be critical because otherwise they won't pay for it. You need to find a solution to their problem that adequately solves it without um, interfering with the, the workflow they already have. And then you have to actually turn this into a product that works within the medium that these people expect solutions to be in. It's like the, that's the mm -hmm. shortest way I can condense the first 250 pages of my book into one sentence <laughs> because that's all. <laughs> like I write about all four stages that I have found to be um, my representation of a business. And I, um, I, I heard other people have different numbers of stages and different names for them. But to me, it it's, doesn't really matter. There's an idea stage. There's yeah. a get the stuff to market stage, which I call survival. Then there's a... a establish yourself in the market stage, which I call stability. And then there's anything beyond, which I call growth. And the idea stage, I call the preparation stage, but it doesn't really matter. The, it's, it's clear that there are yeah. different stages in a business and all of them have different requirements, different priorities, and just different things that you need to look into. And the idea stage, the initial one, before you even go to market, has the, the lion's share of my book, just in terms of page page size. I I think it's must be 200, 250 something pages that really deal with find a market, make sure it's a good market, find a problem, make sure it's not just a nuisance, but it's critical, build a solution or find a solution. There's a difference. Find a solution that solves their problem, validate it, and then build that. Instantiate it if you're a developer like the, as a product, right? A solution is not a product. A product is a pale shadow of a solution. But it's the only way we can actually sell something to people, right? Otherwise, yeah. I mean, a cookbook, yeah. I guess, is a way of sell selling the solution without being the product. But then, you know, the book is the product. But the solution would be actually the meal. That's what, what people want is a step-by-step -step way to a meal if you look at a cookbook, right? So the solution is in the book, but the product is the book. And um, that's what I really harp on for a lot of pages with a lot of perspectives um, in the book because it's really important to me. I've been doing a lot of consulting. I've been doing a lot of mentoring in the last couple of months, which has been extremely enjoyable and highly instructive to actually be able to, let me call it, test my uh, book and the approaches that I had <laughs> with real people with, I, I would say, a lot of success 
which is why I've, I felt uh, confident to actually release the book because it was not completely invalidated by reality. But um, and the approach, audience, problem, solution, product is so much better than starting with a product with I have this idea for an app, trying to mm-hmm. make sure it kind of solves some problem, then hoping that this problem is actually critical and that that actually there are people who might have this problem that you hope is critical that may be solved by the solution that your product kind of is, right? Like, obviously, that's, that is that is how we approach building things. We we see something in the world and we think, oh, I hope there was, I, I wish there was an app. That would be the greatest thing yeah. to be able to solve this now with a couple of clicks. But all the steps leading up to turning this into an actual business, if we miss those, then that's all it is. It's a hope, it's a wish. Turn it around, find an audience, make sure they exist, problem, solution, product. That seems to be a more reliable way to build a business. It's still not 100% guaranteed because you might find yeah, an audience that never is. <laughs> has a problem, but there's no solution for it. Or you might find a solution, but you cannot turn it into a product because they don't use computers for some reason. Or you know, like you, so for some people, you can't build a SaaS product. In some industries, it just will not work because... I guess farmers are one of of these industries. It's super hard to get a farmer on a computer because they're farming. They're out there in the field doing stuff. They may sit in a completely GPS controlled tractor, but they're still not on a computer. They're not connected to the Wi-Fi. It's just hard to reach them. So you might not find a way of putting the medium where the person is. And so the, the, the great thing is at that point, if you're validating your product before you're actually building it, you have not wasted time actually building this, right? So if yeah, you look yeah. to your audience, their problem, their solution, and the product first, every step along of the way, if it doesn't work out, great. You're not going to fail with this business because it's not going to happen. And, <laughs> and, and I think this is something that I just, I've seen work really well with a lot of founders that have taken up this kind of methodology. And that's also why it's such a dominant part of the book because I really want to make a case for it. Right? Doesn't have to be the only thing. There's certainly people. Yeah. If 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 I mean, if if Rob Walling were to produce another product like Drip, something else, maybe completely, he has an audience. He could sell this product without validating a lot of things that other people would need to validate. And it's perfectly fine for him to approach it that way. There's no silver bullet. But if you are a person who who has barely any following who has insight into a really extremely niche market, you're better actually validating all these things along the way than to hope that the thing you're building is actually needed and wished for by an audience you're not even sure exists. Yeah, yeah, so true. Um, One thing that I found a little bit funny is uh, some, like, there was some code in the book, and I really didn't expect that. Expect that. Um, Yep. And we talked about this a little bit before before we started recording, but like, how hard was it for you to strike the balance between writing a business book and not diving into all the nitty gritty code details and architecture and yeah and stuff like that? You can you can be pretty sure that a lot of the blog posts I didn't write include the word like code <laughs> architecture and refactoring and stuff like that because obviously I mean I've I've been I've been building software since the ninth grade. In school, like I've, I had a my first computer was like a yeah ran like Windows Windows three point eleven this kind of stuff. I I still know how to use DOS and this kind of um that's where I come from. Like I'm I'm I was born yeah. in nineteen eighty five, so I'm uh, thirty five at this point. Hey, me too. I, I don't I, I don't really count, <laughs> but you know that that was the time that, that when I grew up, computers were let's say different. So programming, I learned with like Turbo Pascal and then Delphi, which I guess has a, is a big thing in Germany still. There's actually still businesses providing uh, Delphi software. It's, it's hilarious, but um, that is where I come from. So I've always really liked coding just because it's, it's magical. And it's super hard to write about a software as a service business as a technical co-founder without being technical and software-y. Right, it's it's super hard not to talk about. Oh, you really should use Node.js, maybe, or don't use Elixir like we did, because then you won't find any people that you can hire. Because it's super hard to <laughs> hire an Elixir developer, which is not true. Like they're super easy to hire because they're all hanging out hanging out at the same place. Super uh, interesting for us to find my replacement because I really just had to go into the Elixir Slack, say, "Hey, I got a job," 
and then like 300 people said i want a job <laughs> right it, it was, uh, yeah finally a job <laughs> <laughs> because I think so it's, it's still an underrepresented language if you say this to, to a javascript yeah. developer they say yeah well i got seven people who want to hire me today but it's different for elixir yeah. and that, that was a that was a hidden benefit of using a functional and a really good language that barely anyone uses or uses professionally only now is starting to be more uh, widely used but you know all these things honestly if you build a business that's one of the thousands of problems that you have to deal with so i try to check myself and see is this really as important as i think or is Mm. this just important because that's my part of this business and whenever i had this feeling that i was talking about um, text things. And there are a couple of chapters, like you said, that have code in there where I try to tell people build an abstraction instead of integrating things directly because with an abstraction, and that's that's the point, then the business decisions will be easier later because you can remove Stripe and integrate Chargebee or, you know, um, into integrate Cordero because you need your VAT things uh, dealt with and remove Stripe because they can't yet do this. These are business decisions that happen on a code level if you prepare for it. They are easier. They're facilitated by making smart decisions. So I try to kind of hint at the basic concepts of abstractions and not building things in-house, but integrating solutions that are actually much Mm. better, more secure, and more compliant, if you need to be, than your own little um, implementation I've been burned by these things before, so I mentioned them, but I try not to be, um, in the whole book, whatever I'm talking about, I try not to tell people what to do. I try to tell them what I did and what I think is the best thing to do, but I will try not to force my stuff down their throats because I hate books like this. I hate books that try to tell me that there's a a truth that works for everybody. Yeah. I didn't want to be a guru and I don't want to be a guru, like a person that claims to know it all. Like every day on Twitter, I learn something from other people building businesses that are either much bigger or much smaller than my business ever was. It doesn't matter to me. I, I, I think learning is the basic function of a human being. So that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I try not to inhibit by being, I, I'm not vague. I still say what I think. But I try to tell people, apply it carefully and see if it actually fits into your situation. And that's that's why there's not too much code, because code has this kind of truth quality to it, right? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. hard to yeah. say, you should do this <laughs> and nothing else. And here you can copy it. Enjoy. It's not it's not what I wanted to do with this. I'm yeah. considering writing something more CTO or like VP of engineering or just like programmer specific in terms of bootstrapping from that perspective, because that's where I came from. But honestly, I think founders are so different. They are so diverse in where they come from, where they're going, what they want to learn, what they have learned, what they don't want to learn, what they want other people to do for them. You cannot guarantee that tech technical skills are part of this. So particularly for a book, supposedly giving you this introduction into everything, I didn't want to scare away people by being too code focused at all yeah 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 i think that makes sense um and i th- i still think there's room for a a technical version <laughs> of a book like this oh i would love that but but then then you kind of that's that's the thing like imagine i wrote this with my knowledge um of how to build feedback like panda and i all the the source code was in elixir now, now i have the problem that the whole rest of the world who doesn't know that particular functional language doesn't understand what I'm trying to do here, right? And may- maybe there's like Docker files because I use that to, to Kub- Kubernetes config. Like there's so much going on in the space and what you write today could be outdated tomorrow. I I feel yeah. if yeah. you write a technical book, the the half-life of it, the, the, the shelf time even, it's going to be it's gonna be quite low unless you keep updating it all the time. And that was one thing, completely different subject though, but I have to say it, I'm super grateful that um, one of the guys that I met here in Berlin at the Indie Hackers Meetup, and I recommend that everybody who has an Indie Hackers Meetup, either in their city or in their proximity, should really go to it, even though they might be virtual at this point, probably going to be back in in person at some point when in, in 20 years from now when we have a vaccine. <laughs> um, Archim is his name, and he wrote a book on design. It's a really good book on uh, 
just also like yeah, he's a he's a really good writer, and he self published a book, and he told me, dude, you really need editors. You need somebody to look into this and make it professional. And I followed his recommendation, went to a website called Readsy, and found a copy editor and a proofreader. And they both went through the book, told me how many mistakes I made, gave me the whole like work document with revisions, which has had like three and a half thousand revisions for a hundred twenty thousand <laughs> word book. And then I fixed those revisions. Then I sent it to the proofreader, and she came back with two thousand revisions for a hundred five thousand word book. It was hilarious. And so the book that you see now um, that is being printed, that is being sent to people's Kindles had two typos on the, the day I released it. And I've since updated it. It is also versioned because I'm an engineer. So my books have a version. The current book version is version 1.2.2. Um, and <laughs> that is the one with uh, so far zero typos in it and with zero <laughs> weird phrasings or weird colloquialisms, things that I would say in German translated weirdly into into English and nobody would understand. That's what people like yeah. catch, right? It's quality control. It's like yeah. it's like testing. It's like building a test. It's not unit tests, but you know, it's, it's this kind of integration testing where you... Yeah. figure out there's a reader and they kind of look into the book and see if it works for them. That's what having professional people look into your book does. And it was really helpful. Cool. Yeah. That's good advice, I guess. <laughs> Applies to, to almost everything. Get mm -hmm. someone, yeah. someone else to give feedback and uh, make sure like, cause like, Once you start doing it for a while, you get blind to certain yeah. things. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think we have this great opportunity as software engineers, if I switch roles real quick, to put our work out there in, in the open and like open source, like obviously on GitHub and stuff. Because the moment we build integrations for our products, the moment we build like libraries, which people can use to get our use our products, it would be it would be stupid almost not to put them up on GitHub to allow pe people to send bug fixes and issues in there because there's so many eyes on software right now. And I guess hiring an editor is doing the same for a book, right? I've seen people write their book completely in the open, have their potential future readers look into the book. Rob Fitzpatrick, the guy who wrote the mom test, he's building a similar tool for his next book, which funny enough is about writing books, right? And he has this in the open. <laughs> so he has, he has built a product that helps him write his next book on writing books and how to write books, including the audience by including the audience through this piece of software. Like the levels of interconnection here are hilarious, <laughs> but it just shows you if you put your stuff out there, people will help you. Because everybody wants you to succeed because if you succeed, they succeed, right? And you can leverage that. You don't need to make money of this, but it just increases the quality of your work so much by having it out there. And I think as engineers, we kind of have to jump over our shadow and do this more. And particularly as businesses, we have to accept that by showing our code, which we always hide in private repositories, right? Um, mm. At least for the parts that other people in, engage with and interact with, we can do a lot of good and also just honestly be more secure and more compliant. Like if people find like some problem or like a, a code exploitation, like a vulnerability somewhere and they fix it quickly with a pull request, well, that's good for everybody, right? That's, that's something that yeah. you don't need to take care of because somebody else did and you could still work on the things that are important to you. So... I think being in the open, and that's what I've been doing for the last eight months. I've been writing out in the open. Every week I release, I ask people what they think of it. I change my blog posts if people tell me this is stupid or here's a typo, you know, these kind of <laughs> things. So essentially the book being an, an extension of all these blog posts, it has been written out in the open for the better part of a year. And the quality apparently is acceptable. <laughs> Maybe some more ger German <laughs> understatement. I think it's a really good book because everybody who's been reading it and pe many people are now beyond the, the 50% mark. It's a 500 page book. It takes a while to read. People, there hasn't been a single complaint about the contents of the book. People have been saying, this is great. I've actually started recommending it even before they've finished reading a book. Like there's no higher compliment to a first time yeah. um, second language yeah. author like me than people doing this. Yeah. So I'm eternally grateful to the whole the hacker and boots <laughs> founder community it's been such a blessing it's crazy so where can people 
follow you and help out with like future iterations of the book and all your other content that you're about to put out <laughs> well that thank you for that question well i'm on twitter obviously because that's where where i'm always at like every single day you can find me there at uh arvid kahl a-r-v-i-d-k-a-h-l which is my full name and um if you're interested in the book you can go to zero to salt book.com which is uh, <laughs> the domain where it lives that forwards you to my blog the bootstrap founder um, and the page where the book is also where you can find the old guide, which uh, the compendium, the 25,000 word initial version, which I will keep on there for free because I think um, this information needs to be accessible. If you want to support me, buy the book. That's great. And it's going to be more dense. It's like four times the content, but you can also just check out the, the compendium because um, that information is in there as well. Yeah, and, and Twitter. Just reach out to me on Twitter. Um, that's where I'm most reactive, and I just love interacting with people. I love celebrating people. If you have done something cool with your startup, just tweet it at me, and I'll be sure to retweet it. Because <laughs> I just love that. I love seeing other people succeed. I don't know. It's this, this whole yeah. empowering yeah. And, and giving people a boost in a way. That is the most enjoyable thing that I've ever done. It's been been a great great eight months gotta say <laughs> awesome i i think that's a good good place to wrap it up um thanks for coming on and uh sharing your knowledge with us been an absolute pleasure thank you so much bye bye, -bye.